Let's talk now about a 76-year-old British Iranian businessman who's been in prison in Iran for almost five years after being convicted of spying. Kamal Farooghi's family say they're tearing their hair out at the lack of progress in getting him released or even finding out how he is. He was working for an oil company when he was arrested in 2011 and later jailed for eight years. He insists he's done nothing wrong, but Iran won't even allow UK officials to see him. His son Cameron is with me now. We were talking about this to the Foreign Secretary a short time ago and he says that the British government is doing everything possible. And that's what they're telling me as well. Um, um, uh, I keep hearing they're doing everything they can to help. Do you think they are? Um, it's very difficult to, to tell at the moment. Um, you know, they've been uh, you know, lobbying hard, I know, for a very long time. I first uh, made contact with them in May 2013. Um, and they know how long we as a family have been waiting uh, very patiently. Um, and of course, seeing the US prisoners released two and a half weeks ago brings, you know, brings this whole you know, case to the fore. Um, and I you know, encourage them to keep lobbying as hard as they can. Um, we, the Foreign Secretary also did say that he actually, should we have a quick listen to what he said? My Iranian counterpart, uh, we expect, will be in London for the Syria conference on Thursday, and I shall be speaking to him again about this issue. And we are um, optimistic that the Iranians will uh, look positively at the humanitarian case for releasing Mr. Farugi. The Iranians do not recognize dual nationality, so they won't uh, discuss him with us on the basis that he is a British national. Um, but uh, they are looking at these cases from a humanitarian perspective and Mr Farugi is an elderly man with health issues and there are very strong humanitarian reasons uh, for exercising the uh, power of uh, clemency that exists in Iran and I'm very optimistic that we will get some progress. So he's very optimistic about uh, progress. Does that make you feel any more comfortable? Um, well. Uh my father as well, on the morning that the US prisoners were released, suddenly had a meeting with um, his lawyer who was called in and his lawyer assured him that um, his case was being looked at at a high priority and um, was very confident of a very favourable outcome within a week or two. That was two and a half weeks ago. Um, I talked to my dad again uh, just this last Sunday and he like, thinks it might be yet another week. Um, of course, these sorts of messages bring us hope. Um, but as a family, we have been there before. We have heard messages like this about an imminent release only to fade away nine times previously. This is, what this more is the, the tenth time. What can the British government do, do you think? Um, well, it's a very good question. Um, you know, this is a very difficult situation uh, for all of us. Um, and I know the British government has done a lot to date and continues to do so. Um, but not I, enough, I don't, you don't think? Well, the, the problem is he's still there. I mean, the last thing we want, and this could happen any day, is for him to collapse or fall very sick or die in prison. Um, you know, he's been there almost five years, as you said, um, and we're very worried about his health, both physical and mental, and this is taking a, a, a great toll on him. So it's taking too long, is what you're saying. He's being held for spying? Um, that's right, yes. And do, what circumstances? On what grounds? Um, uh, we have no knowledge. There's no evidence to justify the charge. Um, um, he's always maintained his innocence, and we were always convinced that this was a big mistake. Um, and um, but I don't want to really sort of um, you know have an intellectual fight about the merits of the case. Um, I just think want him uh, home. I, we just want him home. That's the only thing, and that's the only reason. I'm what here. conditions is he being kept in? Has he told you? Um, he's not allowed to speak to us about these sorts of things. Um, we, we, we had three years of being deprived of any contact whatsoever. We were extremely grateful to get calls, and we've had calls regularly since August 2014. It's one of the conditions of those calls is that we don't ask, and he doesn't describe the conditions he's held in. Uh, but you can pick up from his tone uh, how he's doing, how his health is. We can pick up um, his, his, the, the mental side of his health. Um, there's been a huge number of ups and downs. There are times when he gets extremely hopeful that he's about to be released, like, like we've had in the last two or three weeks. And then in the past, when that hasn't happened, he's got extremely down and depressed. Um, he just wants to get out of there and get back home to see his family. You know, picture my, of him there with you, is that you? Uh, uh, that is, yeah. yeah. There's a few pictures of when I was young. Um, yeah, my daughters miss their grandpa. They just want him home. And we just want to, you know, him sort of home, get proper medical treatment, get fully checked out. Um, and we'll look after him for the remaining years of his life. One of the other years. challenges is that he's got a dual nationality, isn't it? 
Um, that is a big challenge, yes. Um, I, I didn't know any of this before this happened, but under the Iranian constitution, the, the Iranians don't recognise um, foreign citizenship. And so under, as a matter of principle, don't understand the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the case for a country like Britain coming in and visiting him or asking questions about why, when he's being held. Um, Have the British diplomats had any contact with him? Um, as, as far as I understand, no, never. Why not? Um, because the Iranians won't allow it. I think the, the British have been pushing hard to try and visit him, and uh, as far as I'm aware, the Iranians have never allowed it. So when you heard there from the Foreign Secretary saying that he's hopeful that this uh, should reach a happy conclusion soon, does that lift your spirits? Uh, it does a bit. It is nice to hear the Foreign Secretary saying these words. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, we will never lose hope. Um, but the reality is, uh, it probably lifts the spirits of the nation, but the reality is, until it happens and until he's back here, I won't allow myself to believe it's really happening because we've just been there too many times in the past and to only have our hopes dashed. And we're, we're all going through this constant oscillation between hope and despair, and I, I think it's just incredibly unhealthy for all of us, in particular my dad. But given this new spirit, I hesitate to say entente cordiale as far as Iran is concerned, but you mentioned there that the... Uh, that the American sailors were released just a short time ago and other people that had been held by the Iranians for some several years. That must give you hope as well. That does. And it's incredible that um, things like the um, American sailors, just one phone call between um, Secretary of State Kerry to Foreign Minister Zarif helped solve the issue. And I just heard uh, you were saying that Foreign Minister Zarif, uh, the Iranian Foreign Minister, is coming to London on Thursday. So who knows? It is possible that he'll be bringing with him a great present but I'll believe it when I see it. So what would you say, finally, to Mr Cameron or our Foreign Secretary as far as the Iranian leader or the, the Iranian representative coming? Well, I, I to want to see United this Kingdom. as the top priority for the British government. Um, uh, the British government has lots of priorities and there's lots of talk since the nuclear sanctions have gone down about British business going in and I can see lots of activity there. I want to see the number one priority to, is, is to bring my dad, Grandpa Kamal, home to his family. Thank you very much indeed. We appreciate you. you taking the time to talk to us. Thank, Thank you. you.